record. Okay, so good. Is it recording? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, October, uh, August 21st. This is our seventh session in our uh, African world history, uh, 10,000 BCE to 711 course. Um, if anybody is new, and I don't see any new names, but I'm Dr. Clyde Ledbetter just in case. And we are, uh, yeah, just we have two sessions left. Uh, so welcome everyone. And if you're new, how our class works, I lecture for about uh, five to 30 minutes. And then I, uh, we have the uh, Q and A, and which is recorded. Then I lecture for another 25 to 30 minutes. And then we have open discussion, which is not recorded. So if you have a question or a comment that you don't mind being recorded, you can ask it in the first part, the first Q&A. Uh, and if you would rather wait uh, and to say what you want to say without it being recorded, wait till the open discussion at the end of the session. Uh, so today we'll, we'll cover a lot. Uh, our main topic, we are moving uh, into back into Northeast Africa um, and talking about the Kingdom of Aksum and Christianity in Africa, or early Christianity in Africa. Uh, particularly looking at North Africa and North East, North East Africa. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And that'll take us, uh, we'll be in the years uh, between the first century CE and we'll probably go up to about uh, 500, uh, maybe even 600 CE. So that those, those first uh, uh, 600 years that we'll talk about. Um, and it'll set us up for next week when we talk about um, Islam in Africa, uh, take us up to the year 711 where this course stops. Um, if you are on our email list, you probably received the email that on September 4th, we'll start our next series of classes. We'll be, it'll be a seminar, four week seminar in September uh, entitled, uh, What to the African is Canada? Where we talk about the relationship between Canada and African people uh, over the past you know, 400 some odd years. So we'll talk about that in September. By way of review, uh, last week, we talked about the Bantu migration. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in Central Africa and Southern Africa, as well as the East African coast. We talked about the, you know, over hundreds of years, almost thousands of years of uh, migration that started in the border of what's now uh, Nigeria and Cameroon. And the, these Bantu people brought their philosophy, brought their language, about their technology to the various places that they went uh, throughout Africa, uh, Southern, Central, and East Africa. The terminus of this migration in East Africa is the Swahili coast. And we had a presentation by students, a couple of students. Uh, we had uh, Amani, Kalila, and Whitney we talk about different aspects of African history. But particularly, Amani talked about the architecture of the East African coast and the Swahili city states. And although they were a cosmopolitan people, meaning they had influences from Persia, influences from India, influences from uh, uh, even Oman and other places like that, even far east as Indonesia, the base of that civilization was a Bantu civilization. The base of the key Swahili, the Swahili language, is a Bantu base with Persian and Arabic loan words, but it is a, it's a Bantu language. These are it's a Bantu culture that made up the, the basis of the Swahili city states. Um, and even before they are Arabized, um, we know that these were incredible trading posts. We know this from early Greek explorers who went down the coast of East Africa and called it Azania, or we told the name of the region was Azania. That's uh, so where we get that word from or you know, that part of Africa. And we're talking about from as far north as Mogadishu to as far south as uh, modern day Mozambique. This part of Africa, this East African coast was connected to trade in India, trade in Indonesia, trade as far east as China. So that's what we looked at last week. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about this region in the second part of this class uh, when we get much more uh, historical oral history, written history from the establishment of large polities and, and other groups in this region of Africa. We'll talk more about that in uh, January uh, because the way our courses are set up, we have a seminar in September, 
Then we have the She Rose class, which goes from October to November. Then we have another seminar in December. And then January, we start with part two of this class. So stick around if you want to, uh, to get in on that. So now we're going to just go uh, uh, counterclockwise. And we're going to end up right here, right where you see Southern Arabia almost touch uh, this part of North East, North East Africa, modern day Eritrea, and uh, uh, very close to Djibouti and, and uh, Somaliland. This is what we're talking about, and of course, uh, Northern Ethiopia. This is what we're getting into today. Um, but we're not going to go right into that because today is a very special day, and we have to commemorate two events that are connected um, and that have tremendous significance to us even today in 2021. So before we get into our Africa conversation, um, I'll go back to the timeline. Let's recognize this. The song that was playing was by a group called Bukman uh, Experience, the uh, a Haitian group. Um, and I chose that song because that band is named after uh, an African spiritual leader and a revolutionary leader named Bukman Duty. Bukman Duty, if you don't know, uh, was one of the early leaders of the Haitian revolution. Him and along with a woman named Cecile Fatima uh, were the conveners and leaders of one of the most famous religious political ceremonies in African world history, that being the ceremony at Bois Cayman, where the Haitian uh, enslaved Haitians, Haitians that had liberated themselves through Marunage, meet up in this woods and they perform a African religious ceremony, a ceremony coming out of the Vudun tradition and to get them ready for the revolution that was about to unfold. This is the start of the Haitian revolution, the only successful revolution. Well, I would say successful, successful is, uh, uh, I think all revolutions are successful in their own way. We'll get into that. But when we talk about political independence, a uh, revolution of enslaved people leading to independence, there's, you can't look any uh, higher than the Haitian revolution. It's why it's so important to African world history. It's why Haiti is so important to African people around the world. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit, you know, what we can do for Haiti. Earthquake happened and a lot of things are going down, but we're not powerless. And as much as we needed Haiti to inspire us during enslavement, Haiti, we need to be in solidarity with the Haitian people in all the things, whether it's the political people, environmental people, whatever, we need to make sure we're upholding Haiti. But anyway, in August, on August 14th, 1791, or August 21st, 1791, that date is in dispute, you had this ceremony. Um, so there was a religious ceremony, a pig was sacrificed, and the people were made ready for what they needed to do, to give their lives if needed for the revolution, to end enslavement on the island, uh, and to create a new nation. It's really important to understand with the Haitian revolution, two thirds of the people there in Haiti at the time, they were enslaved in Haiti at the time, were not born in Haiti. These are people direct, the way enslavement worked in Haiti, they just imported people from the continent and worked them to death. That, that was the model, that was the model. It's different in the United States and in Canada and other places where they would import people and make conditions so that and enslaved people would reproduce themselves. So, you know, people would have children and that type of thing. That wasn't a concern of the planters in Haiti. They wanted to maximize the labor that they exploited from African people. So they would import Africans, work them to death, and then import more Africans. So two thirds of the enslaved population in Haiti of African people were born free, so they knew freedom. So when we get to 1791, these people are here, they are joined with Africans that had previously liberated themselves through maroonage or, or, or forming independent African communities, oftentimes in between that border between the Spanish part of the island that would become the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and also in Northern Haiti. And they may meet up, they have this ceremony. And I just want, and Bukman Dodi is a very interesting character. Again, one of these Africans, he's born in the Senegambia, uh, so uh, Western Africa. His name Bukman probably denotes that he was a Muslim or a man of the book. Um, and he's originally enslaved in Jamaica, but he causes so much uh, trouble in Jamaica that they trade him uh, to, he sold in, to Haiti. And in Haiti, he still continues to encourage the people uh, and to fight against this unjust system. And here's what he said uh, at the ceremony. This was, this was his words. The good Lord who created the sun, which gives us light from above, who rouses the sea and makes the thunder roar, listen well. All of you, this God hidden in the clouds watches us. He sees all that the white man does. 
the God of the white man caused him to commit crimes. Our God only asks uh, good works for us, of us. But this God who is so good orders revenge. He will direct our hands. He will hate us. Throw away the image of the God of the whites who thirst for your tears and listen to the voice of liberty which speaks in the hearts of all of us. This was what Bukmandoti said. Again, I just want to also highlight the other co-facilitator of this ceremony was Cecil Fatima. So you have the male and female leadership here in this early stages in the early, uh, of the Haitian revolution. And I really want to focus on this sacrifice of the pig as, as part of the ceremony. Uh, blood sacrifices are common in, in African religions, and common in a lot of world religions. Um, but that's important because it's going to connect with the, the next event that we'll talk about. So when we, when we think about August every year, so many revolutions happen in August, none more significant than the Haitian Revolution, none more significant than, than Bois Cayman. So although Bukman, Cecile Fatima survives, she survives the revolution, she sees Haiti get, uh, get its independence. And in fact, uh, one of her uh, descendants uh, becomes one of the leaders in Haiti a few decades later. So Cecile Fatima uh, uh, survives. Bukman Doti does not. Bukman Doti is uh, about two months after the Bois Cayman ceremony, after the revolution starts and the plantations start to get burned down, and Africans start to uh, fight for their freedom and the revolution kicks off. Bukman Doti is actually captured about two months after on November, uh, November 7th, uh, uh, 1791. So about two months after this, uh, three months after this, he is uh, captured and beheaded. And, and the whites take his head and they try to plant, uh, parade it around and, and they kill Bukman Doti. And they think that this is going to stop the revolution. Of course it doesn't, you know, Haiti gets independence January 1st, 1804, so some 13 years later. So just because you killed the revolutionary, you didn't, they didn't kill the revolution, that's important because death is not defeat. Even though Bukman Doti uh, was killed and they thought by dismembering him and doing all this was gonna cause terror in the hearts of black folks and they would cease with their rebellion, no, it just continued to inspire the people. He becomes a martyr. We don't remember Bukman Dodi. We remember him today. We don't remember the people that killed Bukman Dodi. We don't remember the names of the planters in Haiti. They'll never live forever. Bukman Dodi will. Death is not the defeat that the oppressors want it to be. So the Africans continue to struggle and they get their independence in Haiti. So we move on because today, this day is also another special day. Uh, it is, and it's just an image of uh, a, you know, a painting of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, you know, contemporary painting. Um, August 21st, 1831, so 190 years ago. So Bois Cayman was 230 years ago, 190 years ago. So, so 40 years after Bois Cayman, we get General Nat Turner's Rebellion in Southampton, Virginia. This is the most significant rebellion of Africans in the United States. Not necessarily the largest, but the most significant in terms of the impact that it had on uh, the planter class in the US. Uh, Nat Turner was born uh, in 1830. So he's a 31 year old man when this happens. Uh, from the time he was young, people saw that there was something special in him. He would often get prophetic messages and he knew the Bible. He taught himself to read and write, uh, he was very intelligent. It was a, preacher in his, in, in, in his community and was very influential among enslaved people. So in 1831, Nat Turner, or actually earlier, Nat Turner uh, uh, actually escapes from slavery in 1828 or 1829, he actually escapes, but, and he's out in the wilderness for 30 days. And the spirit spoke to him and told him he needed to go back. And when he comes back and he tells the enslaved African people, look, I got this message from God, told me to come back and to continue to fight here. And they're like, why? You, you, you could have left, you could have escaped, you could have you could have, you know, uh, made it to the North and made it to freedom some type of way. But he comes back and he gets more of these prophetic messages. He starts seeing visions of blood and, 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 and destruction and his hearing you know, voices telling him, you know, wait, watch, wait, wait for the signs. When the sign comes, that's gonna let you know that God's judgment is about to happen and you're gonna be the instrument of God's judgment against this cruel and brutal system of enslavement. So, uh, and again, it's just, a, uh, and we don't have a picture of Nat Turner or anything like that. 
no one painted him uh, or anything. Uh, so these are just reproductions of what he possibly may have looked like. Um, and this is, and when he, he, he does get caught um, a few months after the, the, the revolution, and he's actually interviewed by a white uh, attorney. Um, this was very common whenever there was a rebellion or a hint of a rebellion. They wanted to know everything. They wanted to know what was the motivation. I mean, I don't know what, what else they would need to know other than I'm enslaved, I'm gonna fight, but they wanna know who's involved in all this. So they interviewed Nat Turner. Um, and this is how we know so much about it. But this is what Nat Turner said. He said, on May 12th, 1828, I heard a loud noise in the heavens and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. For the time was fast approaching when the first shall be last and the last should be first. And here's the white attorney named Thomas Gray. And Thomas Gray tries to get him. He says, well, obviously you were mistaken, right? Because now you're captured and we're only holding you for a certain amount of time and you're going to be executed. Your revolution failed. So uh, do you not find yourself mistaken now? And Nat Turner's response was, was not Christ crucified? And by the side, this is how he stops. And then he goes back and he says, wait a minute, just because I'm captured and I'm going to be executed, wasn't Christ crucified and executed? So if Christ wasn't mistaken in his mission and his works continued after his death, why would I be thinking I was mistaken uh, just because I'm about to die? Death is not defeat. So he said, and by the signs of heaven that would make known uh, to me when I should commence the great work and until the first sign appeared, I should conceal it from the knowledge of men and on the appearance of the first sign. So there was an eclipse. Uh, when he saw this eclipse, he took this as a sign uh, from heaven that he should you know, start preparing for his revolution. I should arise and prepare myself and slay my enemies uh, with their own weapons. And immediately on the sign appearing in the heavens, the seal was removed from my lips and I communicated the great work laid out for me to do. Uh, to four in whom I had the greatest confidence. So he brought four uh, brothers together and they started planning the revolution. He said, on Saturday uh, evening, the 20th of August, it, uh, it was greeted, it was agreed between Henry, Hank, and myself, uh, I think that's hard, uh, to, my, to prepare a dinner the next day for the men we expected, and then to concert a plan as we had not yet determined on it. Hank, on the following morning, brought a pig and Henry Brandy, and being joined by Sam, uh, Nelson, Will, and Jack, they prepared in the woods a dinner where about three o'clock I joined them. Very interesting. This is why I wanted to point this out. I'm not saying that Nat Turner knew what went down in Bois Cayman, but you can see this connection. The night that they're about to start the revolution, they get together in the woods, a pig is slaughtered, and they start planning. The same way Bois Cayman 40 years before in Haiti, they get together, Africans get a much larger crowd, gets together in the woods, religious ceremony, pig is slaughtered, and they're about to ready to start the revolution. Right after this is when Nat Turner and, and his compatriots go about uh, and they kill uh, 60 white folks in Southampton, Virginia uh, over the span of a few days. They're eventually overtaken by uh, the uh, Virginia militia that's roused to, to put them down and, they, and, they, and they're defeated. There's more details, but I won't get into it today. And they're defeated. Um, Nat Turner goes on, on the run for a while and he's actually captured at, at the end of October and he is martyred uh, November 11th, 1831. And just like Bukmon Dodi, uh, they dismember his body, they, they skin him and they try to, uh, you know, really terrorize the black community. He's not the only person that's martyred because uh, whites want revenge for the 60 whites that are killed. So they start killing a lot of black folks all over the South. Um, in response, anything that they think might be a rebellion or, or just any African that looked at them sideways was getting killed in the months following Nat Turner's rebellion. And a number of laws were put in place throughout the South, particularly in Virginia, to stop Africans from congregating, uh, limited the, the presence of free Africans in, in, in certain areas and, and the, any black religious ceremony had to be monitored by whites, so on and so forth, all the result of this rebellion. So they think, all right, we've killed Nat Turner, we dismembered his body, we, we did all this, um, it's, it's over. But just like with Buk Von Doty, death is not defeat. Because some 30 years later, we get the Civil War. And all those visions that Nat Turner had of bloodshed, and, and because in order for enslavement to end in the United States, like we talked about on Juneteenth, you had to have this war. And not only that, you had to have 
Africans enter this war and fight for their own freedom. When Africans were able to join the Union Army, that's when the tide of the war turned. And you have people like General Harriet Tubman, who went with a combi river raid and freed 700 people in one night. You had the 54th Regiment and the African colored troops all over the South. Africans that were enslaved that joined the Union Army and were ready to be armed to fight against their former slave owners. These are the visions that Nat Turner had. So you might think, oh, his initial rebellion only killed 60 people and it fell. No, he's seeing the future. He's seeing the the, the, the fight the, uh, of li for liberation that Africans were engaged in some 30 years later. So just like Buk Mondoli, you can kill us, you can you know, dismember our bodies, you can think you're putting terror into the minds of people, but you're just creating martyrs. You're creating people that realize that they're gonna live forever, that death is not a defeat. We're still talking about Nat Turner. We're still talking about Buk Mondoli. Yet the people that killed them, we don't know their names. The masters that own them, we don't know their names because they're not important. They have, they're, they're dead, they're really dead. Whereas Nat Turner, Buk Mondoli, and us as their descendants, we will remember them forever and remember the despair forever. But here's the interesting link with all this. Because like I said, this happens in Virginia. And once the Civil War in the United States uh, happens, the uh, Virginia provides about 6,000 uh, formerly enslaved Africans that fight as troops. And when these Africans have to set up a hospital for themselves uh, as they're fighting against the, 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 the former slave owners, the Confederacy, they name their hospital in Virginia Toussaint Leobertshaw Hospital. Toussaint Leobertshaw Hospital was the name of the hospital for the Africans fighting against the Confederacy in Virginia. This hospital also had an education center next to it, and uh, it was you know, staffed by African women who were nurses and other folks. So it's really interesting when you see the connections in their historical context. The Haitian Revolution had happened, uh, and, and, and the Haitians got their independence some 60 years before this, and in honor of that, and, and with the historical understanding of these are our freedom fighters, these are our heroes, they named the hospital, the Overture Hospital. Um, and that hospital stood in, uh, until the early 19th century. And I think the building uh, that was next hospital is still up at the hospital itself uh, isn't. But I always like to make that connection. All that to say, um, these Africans understood the historical importance of, of, of Haiti and even the contemporary importance of Haiti. We have to do the same thing. Uh, so you're going to hear a lot about efforts to help Haitian people, but I just want to share with you uh, something that uh, was shared with me from this uh, website that I was uh, I'm, uh, on. So let me pull it up. Just some things that you can do if you want to, to, to uh, contribute uh, to the efforts in, in Haiti. Um, there's some rules that uh, this group uh, put uh, together. And let me uh, share my screen to, to share it with you all. Okay. Um, I'll zoom in so we can all see that. These are some This opened up a different way, but uh, so I'm trying to make this bigger so that everybody can kind of see. Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, some things that you can do uh, if you if you're interested in in, in supporting. Uh, organizations in Haiti. Because one of the things that we saw last time when there was an earthquake in Haiti in 2010, there were a lot of people collecting money, a lot of people doing things, not that those resources never actually made it to the people. There was a lot of, when stuff like this happens, there's a lot of you know people that want to exploit the situation that come around. But here's some of the things you can do. Uh, the earthquake humanitarian relief organizations on the ground with a track record for providing year long, year round assistance and relief. Uh, AT uh, Community Trust is a good one. Uh, Hope for Haiti, uh, Mondodo, uh, uh, Focal. These are organizations that are, are um, recommended uh, for, for folks to, to donate to. You can go to their website, you can see what they need. Because one of the other things that they mention on, uh, on this site, uh, open up this, are some things to, to consider. 
uh, as you think about uh, uh, donating. Uh, that those organizations that were mentioned, and I'll email this out to everybody. Um, they, or I'll put these Instagram links in the in the chat. Uh, these organizations are already working, so they're not new organizations. Never an organization is new and it just popped up. They might be exploitative. Not saying always, but it's a possibility. Um, they have good capacity. Uh, you want to pay attention to the accountability and transparency and governance of the organization to make sure that it's actually getting to the people that it needs to get to. Um, the, you know, some things that you might think are needed might not necessarily be needed. It's always important to listen to folks that are on the ground to let you know what is actually needed. So, so for instance, it says supplies that may be seen obviously needed in the wake of a disaster, clothing, water, food may not actually be the supplies that people need or that organizations are able to distribute. Sending donated items that are not useful or culturally inappropriate or undercut local markets could result in what many relief workers call the secondary disaster. Check with the organization to learn what's actually needed before starting a supply drive or mailing a box to an organization's office. For example, you might discover that organizations actually need donations to cover purchasing locally sold supplies in the disaster area as a way to help the local economy recover. So things like that, we might consider, you might think, okay, let's do a, 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 a food drive or clothing drive, and it might be in a way doing more harm than good. So always keep these things in mind. Uh, and follow up, of course. So I'm gonna put these, these this list in the chat uh, so that if folks are interested in supporting any way that they can, uh, you can you can do that because that's uh, it's a time for African people around the world to kind of come together and, and, and do something. Uh, so that's there. So very important uh, day, 230th anniversary of Wakayman, 190th anniversary of uh, Nat Turner's rebellion. So it's important to remember those things. Let's get into what we're actually going to talk about today. It's already 11.33, so I'll go quick and then we'll, we'll take a break after I talk about Axum. So this is what we're talking about, this kingdom here, which is, again, modern-day Eritrea, modern-day northern Ethiopia, kingdom of Axum, really reached its height uh, um, around 400 CE, but it has its beginnings all the way back in 500 BCE. And you notice where this is. This is a very strategic area. We, we can look at these kingdoms and these empires that arose in the time period that we're talking about, whether we're talking about Ghana or Carthage or ancient Egypt, the location, the Swahili city-state, location, 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 so important. That's why, you know, everybody says that. They were able to control this area where folks were trying to trade from Egypt down the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean world. You got to come past Aksum. So if you're able to control that trade route or that point in the trade route, you can become incredibly wealthy, which is what the leaders of the Aksum uh, uh, kingdom were able to do, controlling this part of the Red Sea Indian Ocean trade, very strategic. They also were gifted with great, at the time, a great geographical location inland where uh, there were a number of trees, particular trees that uh, produce that resin that made frankincense, uh, which was uh, you know, the ceremonial perfume uh, used throughout this part of the world, the Middle East, Asia, all the way up into Rome, is incredibly important um, and incredibly valuable. And the trees that produced that were located in this part of uh, Northeast Africa and in Southern Arabia, which Aksum controlled uh, at various points in, in, in its history. Um, there was a back and forth migratory uh, pattern uh, from Africans uh, leaving this part of Africa, going into Southern Arabia, and then coming back from Southern Arabia into this part of Africa. So there's always been a back and forth uh, between this region. It's one of the you know, cultural nexuses of, of the world. So you have folks from Southern Arabia coming into Africa, Africans from uh, Africa going into Southern Arabia, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, what we know, how we know so much about Aksum, uh, we know from the Greek record, Greek was the language spoken even uh, during the Roman times in this part of the world, it was a, a lingua franca of, of the region. Of course, Gez, the written uh, language that would emerge from Aksum that was created around the same time Aksum emerged uh, around 500 BCE. Um, we know from Latin, the, the other Roman language that was spoken. So the Romans operated in both Greek and Latin. Uh, we know about Aksum Hebrew, 
uh, Arabic and of course Coptic sources. So that language that emerged uh, from ancient Egyptian that would become uh, the liturgical language of the Coptic church in, in Egypt and the language spoken by the everyday people in Egypt uh, before the Arab invasion that people spoke Coptic. So we know about uh, Aksum from those types of sources. Then of course we know about Aksum from archeology. span We found a number of coins and um, building structures and, and burials that show, uh, that give us evidence about what was going on, particularly in the time, the early establishment of Aksum, how people lived, um, how social hierarchy looked based off of burials, and, uh, the types of graves that people had, so on and so forth. So this forms the basis of our evidence for this information. If you're following along in the book that I mentioned, and I haven't mentioned in a few weeks, but if you're following along in the, the book that I recommend, uh, Shillington's History of Africa, this information is in chapter, uh, chapter, is this? chapter three. Chapter three uh, was the information that we'll talk about that soon. And uh, chapter five, we'll talk about what we'll talk about in the second half of the class, which is the uh, Christianity in early Africa. Okay, again, Giz, uh, the script created, I mean, back up a little bit, not 500 BCE, but around 700 BCE. Uh, and this would you know, ultimately lead into Amharic. Um, and, and this becomes the liturgical language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So we have a number of writings, uh, both fiction and prose and administrative records all in the is. So it's a language you can still learn. It's, it's not gone, but very, very, uh, only a, a select amount of scholars are, are know it. Um, and again, it's a liturgical language, kind of like Latin in the, in the Catholic Church. Um, so it's, it's still available, still can be learned. Um, and uh, these documents are also there. Um, okay. I said that. All right. Um, so the trade routes. Axum uh, grew incredibly wealthy, being able to control the trade through this part of the world. Um, and as you can see, they often control this place called Saba. You may have heard of it. Uh, it is where the Queen of Saba or the Queen of Sheba emerges from in that biblical story of uh, Queen of Sheba and Solomon, and also a story that would uh, be the basis of Ethiopian kingship uh, many centuries later. When we talk about the Solomonic dynasties that trace their lineage to the relationship between Solomon and the uh, Queen of Saba. Uh, so Sheba is not a name, it's a place. So it's not Queen Sheba, like her name is Sheba, but the Queen of Saba and the relationship with Solomon and then that becomes a Solomonic line in Ethiopia. Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, last Solomonic rule in Ethiopia was Haile Selassie. Um, so this is that region that they're talking about. And this, the Bab el uh, Mandeb, is that region right here where Southern Arabia almost touches Africa. Aksum controlled this. So as Greek merchants and Roman merchants wanted to, uh, trade by sea with the Indian world. They didn't want to go over the overland road. They had to come down here and all imports and exports were taxed by the rulers in Aksum. And this is how they got incredibly wealthy. They controlled, uh, again, luxury goods coming from the interior of Africa, including elephants and, and leopard skins. And again, that frankincense that I talked about, copper, all of that being traded up into Egypt. And then they were able to control the trade of things going as far east coming from as far east as China that were going into this Red Sea world up into the Roman controlled Mediterranean. So they grew incredibly wealthy. Um, just another example of these trade routes that went into India, um, down here into you know, what's now Thailand and things, and then all the way into China. So you see the, the long road that you could take, what they call the Silk Road, which was this road here, or you could take uh, the water route that would take you to these places. That was, you know, uh, really facilitated by the monsoon trade winds, the seasonal winds that operate in the Indian Ocean that take you from India to East Africa and then back once the, the, the winds change, so on and so forth. All right, at one point in 350 CE, so not BCE, but CE, so we crossed over, uh, one of the most powerful kings of Aksum, King Azania, uh, she, uh, excuse me, he 
invades Nubia and, and Meroe. We talked about Nubia a couple of weeks ago, and this was what kind of put the collapse on the, the, the Nubian civilization as a, as a power. You know, people still lived there. You know, he didn't conquer it. He just destroyed it because it was his competition. So with Nubia destroyed, Egypt, uh, Axum takes a much larger a portion of the trade in this uh, region and trades almost directly with Egypt and doesn't have to go through Nubia. Um, so very important event that happens in 350 during the reign of King Pazana, Nega Pazana. Um, the capital of Aksum, Adelis, is right here, uh, a port city, incredibly wealthy city, again, back where all, a lot of this trade was taking place. So they destroyed Meroe in 350 CE. That same year, toward the end of the year, toward the end of his reign, Azana also converts to Christianity, and he is the second major world leader to do so. The first being a uh, major world leader, uh, Emperor Constantine in Rome, well, not in Rome, in Constantinople, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. He converts to Christianity in around 312 or 320. I got to get my date straight with Constantine. But uh, King Azana converts in 350 uh, uh, CE. So why does he convert? A number of reasons. According to the legend, according to the tale, uh, the history as told by the uh, Ethiopian uh, church and, and by chroniclers of Azania, his mother, um, during his father's reign, um, two Syrian uh, missionaries had become shipwrecked and they ended up in the port of uh, Adelis. Again, I remember all this trade is going on, all this international commerce and trade. So, of course, shipwrecks happen. They get shipwrecked. And they end up here because they were on their way to India to actually uh, 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 proselytize Christ. Uh, so they get shipwrecked. They, get, they end up here. They end up in the service of the royal family, one as a cupbearer and the other as a, I think, an accountant of some sort, something like that. But they're also in charge of tutoring the uh, uh, young prince, Azana. They speak Greek, they, you know, all that. So uh, the mother actually becomes a Christian. The father does not. When Azana becomes king, uh, for most of his reign, he's not a Christian. Again, you can't just become Christian because your kingship is almost built on the fact that you are connected with these previous ancestors and the previous religious understanding that the people that you govern have. So you can't just change overnight. We saw what happened when Akhenaten tried to change religions overnight in Egypt back in the day and how that didn't work out. But toward the end of his reign, we see evidence that he has converted and many members of the aristocracy, the royal family, have also converted to Christianity. So yes, it could be a personal revelation that you know he heard the gospel and he accepted Christ into his life and all that. But then there's also a political reason for this, because the other power in the region are the Romans, the, particularly the Eastern Roman Empire. Let me go back to another map. So uh, they're based out of Constantinople, and they still control Egypt. The Romans have controlled Egypt uh, since uh, Emperor uh, Augustus. Uh, so the Romans here, and the Greek, and the Greek-speaking Romans, so although it's the Roman Empire, the language that they're operating in is Greek. The King Azana wants to have a relationship with this other power. One way that you can form a relationship with someone is having the same religion. So he adopts Christianity and some scholars say, well, maybe he did that to form a relationship with the Romans. We know that it was a gradual process. Even though he adopts Christianity, he doesn't force it on the people. And we see this by, uh, through the archeological record, I'm gonna go back a little bit because there's an image I wanna show. Uh, from these coins here uh, and other coins, where on one side of the coin, it has Christian iconography, and in another side of the coin, it has the traditional religious beliefs of the people of Axtum before Christianity. Uh, they, they had different gods like uh, Makarim and some other ones. Uh, so he keeps both to, because he has to appeal to still the everyday people that are in his court, uh, the bulk of the population, which is not Christian, Yet he's also showing that his allegiance to the Christian God and, and even some of his coinage had Greek letters on it uh, so that he can you know, show himself to the uh, Romans that he's a you know, co-religious uh, uh, 
a member of their religion as, as well. So th there's that. But, but I'll stop here to, to take questions because what we're going to get into is uh, although King Azana converts, he's not the first African to convert to Christianity. The, there were masses of Africans in Egypt, in Nubia, and in North Africa among the Amazigh. And even before his conversion to Ethiopia, there were Ethiopians that were Jewish and that were Christians before the emperor become, before the king becomes Christian. And this is very important because we see that we're going to see in, in the second half of class the transition between a religion that is made up primarily of everyday poor people and when it becomes the religion of wealthy, powerful people, whether it's Rome, whether it's Egypt, or whether it's Ethiopia, the religion becomes a little different uh, depending on who's practicing and the motivation behind why they're practicing it. So we'll bring that up in the, in the, in the second part of class and we'll talk about the, the early debates within the early Christian movement uh, in a second. So a stop for a minute. Um, any questions or comments, you can raise your hand and we'll get into that. And of course, I'm, I'm joined again by my uh, permanent TA, uh, Daniel Robson III. He's been minding the chat for me and he let you all in. So Daniel, you see something in the chat or you have a question yourself? I see something in the chat. Somebody asked if the Queen of Sheba was the only Queen of Sheba since she isn't named. Um, well, she does have a name in other sources. So uh, we know her as uh, Makita um, in the uh, Ethiopian sources. Uh, we know her as is it Bilkis in the, in the Arabic sources in, in the Quran. I think it's Bilkis or something like that. Uh, she, she does have a name. Um, uh, so she, she, I don't know if she was the only queen, but she's the most significant queen of that kingdom that we know of historically. Uh, uh, so we, we do have a name. Uh, Mr. Francis, go ahead, and then I'll go to Mr. Thomas. Good morning, everyone. I am going to deviate a little bit, but it somehow relates to what you're talking about with regards to Haiti. Mm. Um, on Monday morning, very early, I heard a CBS reporter said, referring to the earthquake in Haiti, said it was a 7.2 magnitude tremor. And I thought anywhere else in the world, a 7.2 magnitude um, earthquake would be considered a very serious um, event. But this white reporter referred to it as a tremor. And I'm wondering, why do they always minimize whatever happens with Black people, whether it is our suffering or our accomplishments? always minimized. If an earthquake of that magnitude had happened in California, I'm sure the world would have heard more about it than any other event. Of course. Uh, and that's, that's always the case. That's, that's, that's always the case. Um, and you're right about that minimization of, of, of both things. Uh, because as much as we've been saying it over the past few years, uh, in many cases, black lives don't matter to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. It's not just the black people getting killed by police, but other things, whether it's black folks starving, black folks uh, being the victims of environmental racism, whether it's black folks being the victims of uh, neocolonialism and imperialism, that stuff doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so you're, you're right. And I, I'm not surprised by that. At, at all. Um, yeah. Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Morning, all. I am still puzzled as to how this Christianity situation evolves. Could you expand on it? I'm going to in the, uh, in the, in the second half of class. I'm gonna explain uh, uh, what happens. So, and, yeah. um, and based on the first part of the, the lecture this morning, is it, are we not seeing a replica of what, of what that was all about in Afghanistan today? Oh, uh, yeah. Afghanistan is an interesting <laughs> situation because no one ever wins in Afghanistan, ever. No one wins. Alexander the Great didn't win. The British didn't win. The Russians don't win. Nobody wins in Afghanistan. They, you, they say about Afghanistan, it's easy to get in. It's hard to get out because no matter what people think of the Taliban, 
the, the Afghanis don't like outside interference. They're going to change something. They're going to change. Taliban didn't always exist. That's an internal movement that then comes out. They will fight uh, and they will continue to fight. And they know it's very harsh terrain. They know the terrain. They know how to blend in. They know how to fight when it's their advantage and not fight when it's not their advantage. And, and Afghanis always win. Um, and yeah, it's history repeating itself again and again because no one ever wins in Afghanistan. It's, it's, it's um, a very hard place to, to, to do things militarily if you're not Afghani, if you're not of that region. Um, outsiders don't win in Afghanistan. Uh, I saw the Gupta Empire. I know that a number of East Indians. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't have the answer to that about uh, the Indians because I'm not 100% sure. Daniel, go ahead. And if you're talking, you got to unmute. Not sure. Daniel, go ahead. If you can hear me, go ahead. Sorry, Claire, my internet is a little bit slow. I, I was just about to present that question about India. That's all I was going to Oh, answer. okay, okay, all right, all right. So let me get back, let me get into uh, the second part that we can have open discussion. Um, so what happened? So let's go back a little bit. We're not going to, we're going to go back a little bit from 350. I just wanted to end with that because we're talking about that soon. When, so Christianity, breaks off from Judaism really pretty much after the, uh, the, the, the death uh, of uh, Jesus of Nazareth in 33 CE, around 33, 34 CE is when that happens. And his followers take his teachings and form a new version of Judaism. This is really what it starts out. It starts out as uh, a... Uh, yeah, this map will, will work out well. It starts out as a form of Judaism. All the first disciples, all these folks are, are, are Jewish people. But as their form of Judaism grows, they take on different practices and, and the message spreads to other people. So it starts from you know, his first followers um, and then they convert other people. Um, and you know then... Uh, it really gets a, a big boost uh, once Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul and then he starts spreading Christianity all throughout some of these names. If you're a Christian, you might know some of these names like Antioch and Tyre and uh, Ephesus and all the, all the way to Rome. You know, Paul does that. But these early communities are, for the most part, either early or, or, or either Jewish communities in some of these major cities in the region. Because uh, at the same time all this is going on in Palestine and Israel, this is under Roman occupation. It means you see these stories in, in the Bible, Rome controls this area. And, and the Jewish folks are in continual, re, continuous rebellion, many of them against Roman occupation. Uh, so there's a whole lot of messianic figures. It's not just Jesus Nazareth, there's other figures in this Jewish rebellion against the Romans. Um, and they're fighting, they have the Essenes that go up in the hills and they're fighting against the Romans, so on and so forth. But in 70 CE, the temple is destroyed and the Romans again kind of promote a spreading of the, the population of these rebellious Jewish folks uh, throughout these major cities. And they had been moving even before the Roman period to different places in the world. So you have Jewish populations in Egypt, um, in Nubia, uh, in Aksum, and in, in, in Ethiopia. Because again, you have to think, all these people are connected by trade and roads. The ancient world was not as isolated as we think of it. You know, all these people are connected. So you have Jewish populations all over North Africa um, uh, and, and, and the like. So when the followers of, of, of Jesus start spreading that message, it first attracts those Jewish populations in big cities like Alexandria in Meroe, in Aksum, and they start, they, they hear this and they start to adopt it. 
it also starts to be adopted by when, when Paul spreads it, other folks in the Roman Empire that are the downtrodden. So this is not a religion of the wealthy. You think about the message that Jesus had. This is a religion of downtrodden people, people that don't have a lot materially. And you also have to remember in these first decades uh, after 33 CE, after you know, Christ's death, um, his initial followers believe that he's coming right back. It's, just not a, it's not a thing that they're thinking hundreds of years ago. They believe when, when that their Messiah is going to come back in their lifetime. So many of them sell all their possessions. Uh, they form you know, these communal living spaces. And, you know, that's how they live. And this spreads. And it starts to spread in writing. About 40 years after uh, Christ's death in 33 CE, the first gospel is written. That's the gospel of Mark. That's the shortest one. And is written at uh, Mark is uh, tradition has it that Mark ends up being based in Alexandria, being based in Egypt. Um, so some forty years after you know Christ's death, you get the Gospel of Mark written, um, and a number of other gospels follow after that. A lot of the names of the gospels are attributed to people that were with Christ, but they probably weren't written by those actual people. So Matthew probably wasn't written by Matthew. John probably wasn't written by John, uh, but they were told orally and then written down. And then they used Mark to fill in some other things and then they added other things uh, based off their own recollection and depending on the audience that they were trying to reach. It's just like any other, the, the gospels are like biographies. Um, every biography is different. It's been, what, uh, 50, 53, is it 53? It's been about 53 years since uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. There's been a number of biographies about Martin. Now, all of them aren't the same. If they all were the same, nobody would, buy, they, they all give something different. Different historians talk about different things. And, you know, you have people that were with Dr. King, like Jesse Jackson or Andrew Young or Fred Shuttlesworth or uh, uh, Ralph Abernathy, these types of people that had their own perceptions and encountered Dr. King different ways. And they wrote about that their experience with Dr. King. It's all valid, but they're gonna talk about different things. Same thing you see in the gospels. Matthew is written for a Jewish audience. So he focuses on the Jesus's uh, uh, genealogy because he's trying to connect him to prophets of the past and prophecies of the past that the Jewish audience would know. John's audience is more of a Greek audience that's engaged in philosophy. So there's a lot more philosophical stuff in, the, in, in, in John, you know. And the, the word logos, logos is, is word in Greek, very important concept in Greek philosophy. So, and the God was the word and the word was with God and all this that you see in the beginning of John. That, Cause that's for that audience and so on and so forth. So you start to see it spread and, and different people have different books and different understandings of, of, they have the same basic message but there are some differences in how they understand uh, who Christ was. But one thing that unites all of these communities is they see Jesus as the, as the Messiah. They think he's coming back in their lifetimes and they are not engaged with the Roman empire in the way other citizens are. So the Romans are incredibly uh, you know, suspect of this new cult. This is what they call it, this new cult. Um, they won't make offerings to the Roman officials because the Roman empire was seen almost as a divinity himself. They won't make offerings. They won't engage in any of the uh, festivals of, of, of the Romans. Uh, they don't understand the Christian traditions, particularly the uh, communion and other things that, that the Christians do. Uh, so they're looking at them as, as suspect. And they're also and the Romans are used to dealing with rebellions, rebellion from Jewish folks, rebellion from other oppressed people throughout their empire. That stretches all the way at this point from Britain to uh, uh, this area of the world or around here. This is as far east as the Roman Empire goes. So they're used to rebellion. So they don't want anything that might inspire rebellion. So even though the, the Christians say that they're peaceful and they're taught to give to Caesar what Caesar's and God's, the Romans don't buy that. They think that this is some new cult that's going to cause trouble. So they start persecuting these folks. Uh, and the persecution really gets bad underneath the emperor Diocletian, who lived uh, uh, 245 to 316 CE. 
he's known among Christians as the great persecutor. Now the Christians have been blamed for other things, by the Emperor Nero and other folks for all types of things. They've been persecuted, but this was the worst. And Diocletian went around the empire and he said, all right, you Christians, wherever you are in the places that we control, whether that's North Africa, whether that's uh, uh, Palestine, whether that's Egypt, we are going to uh, force you to, number one, make an oath to the emperor and recognize that the emperor is the representation of God on earth, not this Christ figure that you keep talking about. You're going to have to give us all your sacred texts um, and turn over your temples and, and all of that and, and convert them back into you know, uh, Roman religious places, because a lot of the early churches were actually Roman, repurposed Roman temples. Uh, but the people, some of them resisted. A lot of the, uh, particularly in Africa, a lot of the, the uh, religious officials uh, resisted, the Christians resisted. Some of them did not. And in North Africa, particularly this region here, among the Numidians and the Amazigh or the Berber people who had adopted Christianity, they uh, had some officials that just gave up and they gave up the, the biblical text and the, the sacred writings to the Roman uh, officials and they, you know, they just bowed down and everything. But then uh, after Diocletian, another emperor uh, arises and that's Constantine. So that must've been 320 when he converted. Constantine becomes emperor. And uh, because he converted to Christianity, he uh, doesn't, uh, he allows it to be a religion again without persecution. He doesn't, it doesn't become the official religion of the Roman empire until many decades later, but he stops the persecution because he's himself has become a Christian, uh, Constantine. So when this happens, those old religious leaders that had given up the text in, in North Africa had want to come back. And but the, there was a group of Numidians the North Africans led by a man named Donatus. Donatus said, you can't come back. You can't be a bishop again after, in the face of persecution, you lay down. You uh, gave up the, uh, uh, the description. So no, you can't be a bishop. No, you can't uh, 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 lead the sacraments and, and, and do all these things, bless things. You can't do any of that. You can't come back. God may forgive you, but you can't become an official in the church again. This caused a lot of problems in North Africa between those, the camp of the folks that wanted to come back and they were basing it off of, and even uh, Emperor, uh, not Emperor, excuse me, uh, Augustine, the great Christian theologian was in that other camp of folks that's saying, if God can forgive, you should, we should be able to forgive and folks should be able to come back and be bishops and all that. And the Donatists, so there were a lot of fighting. There's a lot of fighting. And then there were some other uh, issues that the new emperor in Constantinople, Constantine, uh, wanted to iron out. Because here's the transition that we're seeing at this point. Once the emperor Constantine becomes a Christian, this is the culmination of a process that had been happening for a few decades. What started out as a religion of poor people, of oppressed people throughout the Roman world, slowly started to get infiltrated by wealthy folks and people with power like religion seem to you know do you know people hear about new religions and they might actually themselves have a, a personal conversion or, or, or whatever and and they want to be uh, you know a part of it but they don't give up their previous way of looking at the world i should say so you have a lot of these rich folks that are joining the christian movement and they say oh you guys are just meeting at people's houses or you're uh, meeting outside or you know this, why don't I buy you a church? Oh yeah, and since I bought the church, um, I think I should be the bishop. Uh, I should be the religious leader because even though this is some, you know, 1700 years ago when this stuff is taking place, human nature is human nature. Our technology may have changed, things around us may have changed, but human beings are human beings. We have the same motivations. And unfortunately, a lot of us are motivated by two things, power and money, power and money. And both things are incredibly addictive. So some of these new rich people that come in, they're thinking, okay, yeah, I'm in this church. I've I, I provided the church building. I provided the funds. I should be bishop. And now I want power. And I'm going to twist whatever gospels or whatever things that I have to make sure that 
I remain in power and that my group remains in power. So money becomes involved as the church becomes richer and more established in these various places. And these bishops get more power because they have more folks coming into their uh, 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 church bodies. So what started out as people all sharing their, their worldly goods and uh, putting everything in common and everybody's kind of living equal and they're just, you know, uh, praying together and, and waiting for the comeback of the Messiah. So these new folks are coming in like, I don't know if Jesus is coming back right now. So I'm going to keep my wealth and I'll just, you know, engage in the other things and, and become a bishop. And then I'll have some people following me uh, and telling me that I'm special and all that. Again, that power. You see it today with a lot of these churches. People just want to be powerful. They just want to tell people what to do. They just want to be put on the pedestal, even though they're all supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. But I digress. So anyway, that split happens. The Donatists and, 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 and the, the, the ones that are trying to come back. The Roman emperor uh, makes a decree and he says, no, you have to let those people come back. And then the Donatists become the persecuted. When the Roman Empire, the Roman emperor sides with those folks that want to come back, the Donatists then become uh, persecuted and that becomes the faith of the Numidians and the Amazigh people in North Africa. They combine it with also some uh, traditional beliefs that they had. And that becomes their faith as they fight against the Roman empire politically. So the Romans back the sellouts. So the, the, rude, the true revolutionaries in this region that have been fighting against the Romans, that don't want to be controlled by the Romans, they adopt this Donatist faith and they continue to fight in North Africa against the Romans. And they're going to also have a fight against the Arabs in about three, centu uh, three centuries when they come over. Uh, so that's important. one of the first important splits in the church in North Africa. The other, uh, the, the other split, let me unmute everybody, I'm sorry about that. There it is. The other uh, conflict, as these churches were emerging, um, and again, there, at this point, there's not one Bible. Um, there's, uh, everybody has different books. Uh, it's not all put together. There's different understandings of what they call Christology, the nature of Christ. And one of them, the more uh, famous ones that emerges is uh, the Arian controversy. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just typing sound. Uh, all right. The Arius. Arius is someone when we say Arian is when I talk about like white power Arian. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, this comes out of Africa. It comes out of Alexandria in Egypt. And there was a church leader named Arius who looked at the Bible, came up with a theology that when we talk about the nature of Christ, that the son was created by the father out of nothing, which means there is isn't hierarchy. There's the father and there's the son and the son was not co-eternal with the father. Uh, so he started having some followers. That said, okay, yeah, we read the same thing that you read. That sounds about right. So they start their, their faith. But there's a bishop in Alexandria that has a different understanding of things. And then this becomes a controversy. What is the nature of Christ? How is this going to be solved? Because we have all these churches in North Africa, churches in Rome, church in Constantinople, church in Jerusalem, churches in uh, other parts of uh, Antioch and, and even churches in, in, in Nubia. And they all are trying to figure out, okay, what is the best way to approach this of who Christ was? Is Christ completely divine? Is Christ a man? Is Christ some combination of both? What's the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? All this. So a council is called in 13 and 325, Council of Nicaea, right around here. And they meet, and this version is shot down. This version is shot down. Um, and the official response, and this is overseen by Constantine, because what does Constantine want, this emperor? He wants one church. He wants it so 
that there's one understanding of Christology. There's one understanding of how things are going to operate in the church. Because when there's one church, it's easier to control. Because he's also the Roman emperor. He wants control. He wants things to be uh, uh, streamlined and him at the top. So if all these bishops and all these folks are fighting, then you don't, or, or not even just fighting, but they have these different philosophical beliefs. There's no one church. In fact, even that word Catholic, Catholic means universal. This idea that they're trying to build a universal church, one understanding of, of Christology. So they meet in Nicaea and it's decided that the father and the son are, uh, are co-eternal, existed together and they reject Arianism. But the people that follow Arianism, you know, don't. So you have these conflicts in, in Egypt over the followers, but eventually Arianism goes away and that belief kind of stays after a while. The other conflict over Christ's nature, the one that's more important, the one that's lasted is the Miaphysite controversy or the Miaphysite understanding of God. Some folks call it monophysite. This is the belief that Christ has a single nature. And this forms the basis of the churches in Egypt, Nubia, and Aksum, the African understanding of Christology. That it's, it's it gets really complicated and into some, uh, just a difference between an of and an in. Uh, so the Bishop at Alexandria is saying Christ is one nature uh, of God and the word incarnate. So it's just one thing. He's God, the spirit, and man all in one thing, one nature. Constantinople, this is this, um, another idea that was brought up, was Christ's manhood was observed, absorbed by his divinity. So Christ was born a man, but then when Christ uh, gets baptized, he becomes divine. So there's all these types of things. But all these debates are happening. So they have another ecumenical uh, council uh, at Chalcedon, and this is where the big split happens between what's going to become the Roman Catholic Church and what's going to become the Eastern and the Coptic Church, as well as the Church in Ethiopia. It's the Catholic comes the, the first. And there's a whole, all these debates and these votes and people are beat up and there's a lot to this. I won't get, I can't get into all of it now. But the first idea, the first statement that they came out with in Council of Chalcedon was, I, one nature out of two was the first thing that they all agree on. One nature out of two. So it's two natures, man and divine, but there's one nature out of two. But then after some controversy, some other votes and some other people showing up to the meeting, then it became, one person in two natures, so not out of two natures, but in two natures. And this becomes the, uh, uh, the official version of Christology, of the nature of Christ. One person in two natures versus one nature out of two. Just so that change in words, out of and in, becomes the basis for a schism that still exists. So in Africa, and the Coptic church and the Ethiopian church is Christ as a single nature versus the Roman Catholic understanding of things and Christ, uh, the one person in two natures understand. And it gets complicated, I know it's confusing, but those two little words are the difference between how these churches operate. And again, at the end of the day, it's all about control and money because when you have these little changes and people are going to lose positions based off of who believes what, then, uh, and who's gonna be under what. So if everybody had agreed, it would have been one church. There would have been a bishop at Rome and that would have been a bishop over the Pope, that would have been over everybody. But you had a bishop in Alexandria, the, the leader of the Coptic church, who also was over the church in Ethiopia. So they had their own position, their own followers and their own money. You see, so these ecumenical disputes or these philosophical disputes over the nature of Christ are not just about the philosophy and the theology. They're also about the, the, the mechanism of who's going to control the church, who's going to you know, be the true uh, uh, church and all the stuff that comes along with that. So that split happened and then, you know, we, we still have that today. These churches here, Neophysite, um, the one in Rome, the, the Catholic Church, 
uh, that other uh, understanding of, of Christ's nature. That is gonna lead us into our next session. Uh, yes, the, the, the three and one is the Catholic uh, understanding. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. So what happens is the official position of the Roman Empire is that Catholic position that comes out of here. But the bishop in Alexandria in Egypt is still has the Miaphysite position. Christ has a single nature. So there is this issue. The church based here in Constantinople in Rome, that is the official church of the empire, which still controls Egypt, starts to persecute the Miaphysites, the bishop in Alexandria and the other followers of the, who are the majority of the population here in African Egypt and in Nubia and in, and in Ethiopia. They start to persecute the Africans here in Egypt. This persecution continues and they're fighting against the Romans both politically and religiously now. Then all of a sudden, about three centuries later, or after this, it's about two centuries later, uh, in, in the 650s, we see another movement emerge coming out of Arabia from the followers of Muhammad of Mecca. The Africans in Egypt see this emerge and the Romans are also fighting against the Persians. And they say, maybe if we appeal to this new group that's coming on the scene, these Arabs, they can help us get, kick out the Romans. And then we can practice our Miaphysite version of Christianity. So they make an appeal to the Arabs to come help them fight against the Romans. And what ends up happening is they just replace the Romans with the Arabs. And this is how Islam enters this part of Africa, which is what we'll get into uh, next week. So you have to be careful what you ask for sometimes uh, when uh, trying to replace one oppressor with someone that you think is going to liberate you. You can only liberate yourself. Uh, so with that said, we will uh, stop for today. I'll pause. I'll stop the recording.